Hello and welcome to Lord of the Board. My name is Sam Smith and today we are going to be exploring the world of Crescent Moon. Crescent Moon is designed by Steve Mathers and it is illustrated by Navid Rahman. And also, this is published by Osprey Games. If you haven't really been following the channel, my favorite release of last year was an Osprey Games release being Imperium Legends and Classics. This game was one of my most anticipated games of 2022. Today I'm just going to be exploring this board game, kind of telling you guys a little bit about how it feels, and hopefully by the end of the video, maybe you'll decide if this is going to be something that's going to hit your table, but if not, maybe it's just going to be informational for you. All right, so what exactly is Crescent Moon? Crescent Moon is a four or five player asymmetric war game set in the early 10th century of the Middle East. Now, instead of this being an exact time or moment in history, this is more of an artistic expression of the time period. You're gonna be playing one of five characters that are going to kind of symbolize different powers and positions that would have been relevant of that time period. Now, each of these positions that you can play is asymmetric, but actually it's only asymmetric in the way that Root is, where there's multiple actions that are going to be the same and shared between players, like moving and attacking and influencing locations, but then each faction has a different way to score victory points, as well as some special actions that are unique to them. Now, I'm gonna be kind of giving an overview of each of those characters now, and let's start with the Sultan. They are the main supplier of income throughout the game. That is because they can construct settlements which provide more income for themselves as well as other players. And then they naturally will be buying other players' cards from the market, giving those players their income because they don't actually have their own cards within the market. Now this creates a very fun and interesting economy in the game that is run very much so by the Sultan's decisions. Now, a player who benefits very highly from this is the player with the most activity circulating in those markets, and that is going to be the Mershid player. They are the plotters and schemers throughout the game, and they mostly care about influencing areas rather than controlling them. And because they have the most cards in the market, they're going to be getting a lot of their main income from the Sultan. Now, in the opposite vein of things where the Mershid player wants to influence different hexes, the Caliph wants to control hexes with units and strongholds to secure their victory. They'll get points for protecting areas, even if it's not their own buildings that they will be protecting. In fact, they like to be protecting those towns and cities that the Sultan generates. They're also one of two powers that can actually create their own force instead of using mercenaries. Now, the Warlord has the least struggles in army building. They're going to be building a lot of units and getting ready to take over the land. Their entire goal is to tear down all of their opposition and sack towns and cities and strongholds, and they are especially good at tearing down undefended buildings. Characters like the Sultan and Murshid that can't produce their own units have a very hard time fending off the Warlord's grasp. And that is where the Nomad player comes into play. They will gain income by selling mercenaries to players like the Murshid and the Sultan, as well as they are extremely mobile and are able to pop up anywhere on the board. And then later they can trade in money for victory points. And so you see just by those kind of quick little ideas of how each faction works, you see that each one kind of lends into each other. Every move pretty much benefits other players in some way. Now, one of the nicest things about this game is that every single character comes with a player sheet. And this player aid has all of your player actions here on the front. And then if you open it, you also have a page that is the Council from an Old Advisor, which I have a series of Council from the Old Advisor kind of breaking down the characters. There's gonna be links to that down below if you wanna check those out. But this basically just gives you an idea of how that character should play and kind of what their main opportunities are within the game. And then on the back of this player aid, it gives a breakdown of what income they'll be gaining, and then also the stats of buildings within your empire. Now, I know that I have a lot of Root fans on the channel, and one of the most common things that people are going to ask is, 
is this game a Root clone? Is this game like Root? And I can say that while some of the politics of the game are similar to that of Root, where player positions are going to be intermingling per se, um, the mechanics of the game are nothing like Root. In fact, I am going to be definitely keeping this game in my collection alongside Root. Now, one thing that I really love about Crescent Moon is the asymmetry within the game. It's simple things like most factions in the game, their build action allows them to build two buildings, whereas the Sultan is allowed to build three. A lot of the stronghold buildings like forts and castle cost two and four respectively, except for the Caliph, it's only gonna be one or three coins for each of their strongholds. Little changes like that actually apply a lot within the main framework of the game. Another concept that I really enjoy within Crescent Moon is actually the board. So there is a way to variably draft the board and set it up by drafting each of the tiles, but there's also all of these pre-game setups that each pose a different opportunity. And one thing that I've found is that some definitely benefit certain factions, but they all seem to be pretty balanced and each different archetype of board has a four player and a five player version. Oh, by the way, if I didn't note it, the five player version includes the Nomad, and if you're playing a four player game, no player can take the Nomad. So if you're super excited about the Nomad, this is essentially a five player game for you. I don't know if that helps you decide, but it is something to definitely keep aware of. Now, each of these hexes that makes the game board actually do different things. For example, quarries are going to be providing more income if you control them throughout the game. And then also fertile land gets some income as well. Deserts, mountains, and wilderness tiles don't provide any income if you control them. And then there's also river tiles, which can't be passed by by your troops unless you are at the river crossing. There is another way, which is going to be a card, and I'm gonna be getting to those cards in just a second here, because that is definitely one of my favorite parts of this game. The other concept that I find very interesting in Crescent Moon is kind of the three main layers of player positioning throughout the game. For example, if you have any pieces in a territory or hex, you have presence in that hex. And there are certain abilities that allow you to do things in hexes that you have presence in. But there's also two other layers. If you have military units such as stronghold buildings like forts or castles, or units like mercenaries or the standard units, that is going to mean that you have control or military control of that hex. And that is important for gaining income from that in the income phase. That's also important for building buildings at times. But then there's also another layer, which is the influence. This is extremely important for some factions like the Mershid to make sure that they can interfere with everyone else's combats and moves. And I just really love the aspect that there's so much deal making just within a single hex in this game. For example, I love to play the Caliph, and one of the things that I often do is I try to make a deal with the Sultan and be like, hey, build a city where I am at, and I will protect your city since you can't make your own units. I'll gain some victory points from that, and so will you, and I'll be protecting that city from being sacked by the Warlord. And then maybe later we make a deal for the Mershid player and be like, hey, if you wanna put your influence token in here, come on in and we can all be benefiting from this tile simultaneously. And so there's so much deal making like that where one single clearing can have so much different factions intermingling in different ways. And that is one of my favorite parts about Crescent Moon. Now, all of the cards are going to be in one of four colors. Now, whenever a player buys from the market, they have to pay those coins to the player that the card belongs to. These cards have super nice benefits that help for combats, and they also help for influence contests. Basically, both of the ways that you can expand your territory in the game. They also have some cards like ships, which will allow you to pass the river, which can be really, really powerful. Now, like I said, the Merchant player has most of the cards in the market. And so oftentimes their main way of income, since they don't really get a lot of control on the board, they can't gain income that way, they're gonna be gaining most of their income from players just buying their cards in order to gain an edge against their other opponents, or maybe even them. 
There's also this special market that the Sultan has. This special market of three cards, they set the price of these three cards. If a player wants to buy something from it, they can set it to whatever price and that player has to negotiate whether that's worth it for them to buy it or maybe make a deal to make it a little less. If you're thinking that there is a lot of deal making in this game, yes, there is an extremely large amount of deal making in this game. If you're not good at making deals and player interaction and political positions, you're not going to really have a good time with this game. There should always be some sort of motive for every action, and you have to try and convince other players that that movement or motive is a good idea. You don't want to be buying too many pink cards, for example, otherwise they're going to get completely loaded. But every player needs some cards, and sometimes only pink is in the market. And I just really, really love how clean that design is, and it reminds me a lot of the Dune board game where every single card that you would buy, basically the money would go to the Empire. It has that same feel, but every player kind of has certain cards in the market that they get paid out on. Oh, just to note, when you buy your own color in the market, you actually get half off. I think the biggest thing that's going to make people not want to play this game or not really feel interested in investing in it is going to be the player count being four or five. However, I will say that I am very, very glad that they have it at four or five instead of giving us a lower player count mode that just doesn't really feel very good or, or strong or clear. Now, another interesting thing about Crescent Moon is that when you are gaining victory points during the scoring phase, unless you're the Warlord who gains victory points as you go throughout the game and as you're sacking buildings, but as you gain victory points, those victory points are going to be gained publicly and then placed face down in a secret pool in front of you. So players, they kind of know how many points each player has in the game, but they're not fully certain how many victory points each player has. And I think that's very, very fun because it keeps everyone engaged all the way till the end. Even if you feel like you've been doing really bad, sometimes it will really surprise you how well you actually did compared to other players. Most games of Crescent Moon have come out to be very, very close, but it's always, always been a good time. But friends, what is my favorite thing about this game? I think it's gotta be how oddly simple it is. You only get one action per turn, and every player has their action player aid right in front of them. So on your turn, you can clearly look at the action read through the whole thing. Now there's a lot of text, but if you read through it, you will understand how each action works. Every player gets one action a turn, and so these player turns go by really, really fast. Four action rounds makes up a year, and the basic game is three years long. Therefore, you get 12 actions in the game, which is not a lot at all. You could also play the long game, which is four years long, giving 16 actions per player. But even at four or five players, this game goes by quite fast for the experience that you're getting. All the epic moments from the very first moves to the last. See, the thing about Crescent Moon that makes it so special is the fact that every single player position right at the start of the game is entangled. From the first influence action that the Mershid plays that, that means so many different things for other players around the table, or the first city or market that the Sultan builds that other players that control that hex will be benefiting with extra income. Or maybe the Warlord massing up a large army in the first turn and moving around the board taking the holy site for extra victory points. These moments mean so much things for multiple different players. It's the fact that when it's not my turn, I am just as engaged in the negotiation as when it is my turn. And I think that's what I love most about Crescent Moon.